stars of animation are shining. It's time to stay tuned. And now, here's your host, Phil Mackey. Hello once again, and welcome to the show. Strap on those headphones tonight, because you're in for some real fun. Tonight's special guest is Paul Rugg. After performing at Acme Comedy, he got his start in animation writing for the acclaimed 90s cartoon, Animaniacs. He went on to help create Steven Spielberg Presents Freakazoid, a zany cartoon that may just have been ahead of its time. It was sadly short-lived, having only 24 episodes over two seasons, but the loyal following is still strong to this day. Paul Rugg is here to talk about his role as a writer and actor for this bizarre comedy in just a few moments. But first, this. Super Teen Extraordinaire, Freakazoids, Freakazoids, runs around in underwear, Freakazoids, Freakazoids, guess he's watching to be seen, Freakazoids, Freakazoids, and have something better on TV, Freakazoids, Freakazoids, his brain's overloading, it has a junction coding, textbook case for Satan and Freud, Freakazoids, Freakazoids. We interrupt this interview with Paul Rugg for an important announcement. I love you. <laughs> oh, Joe Leahy. I love Joe Leahy. He was our announcer. He still is. If we ever do it again, Joe is the man. Where did that idea of interrupting a show with text on a children's cartoon, where did that come from? I'm going to say that it probably started on the first one, which was Dance of Doom. And John McCann, who's a brilliant writer and one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life, He sort of developed that style because we knew we were going to have an announcer. And when Joe Leahy came in, we're like, oh, my gosh, we need to do this like all the time. Yeah. And uh, and that's sort of how Freakazoid happened. It would be like like John would write something. I go, oh, my gosh, we got to do that a lot. Like Cosgrove, I don't think he he was not. I I think it was just Andrea Romano said, I got Ed Asner to come and be the policeman. We're like, oh my gosh, that's great. And it it was going to be used once. Right. But once we heard, you know, hey, Freakazoid, we're like, okay, I think we need to do this a lot. It's a strange relationship, but it works really well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And John developed so many of uh, of the techniques we used, and especially that one. So, yeah, I mean, you got some really strange moments where like they're flying a plane and he's pointing out stuff that's coming at them. It was <laughs> at some point Marlon Brando's coming at. Them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's what that just made us made us giggle. And what we were doing there for those that are really want to go deep in the weeds here, we were doing a parody of Plan 9 from Outer Space, oh, um, wow. which was an Ed Wood Kids, yeah. or whoever is watching this, if yeah. you're adults, young adults, just look up Ed Wood, look up Plan 9 from Outer Space. There was a cockpit scene in that movie. It was probably awful. But the stewardess kept coming in saying, that was quite a jolt. <laughs> that's quite a, that was quite a jolt. So we just threw that into our script. That was quite a jolt, freak. And, uh, and I remember working with Tracy Rowe going, this is how it has to sound precisely. That's Kai Jolt Freak. Leave it to you guys to homage the worst film ever created. <laughs> yes, uh, we that did one. that a lot. Yeah. What can you tell me about how you break the fourth wall so well? You mean on fr- Freakazoid? Well, in general. I mean, you can, break, yeah. you can break it right now if you want. Yeah, well, all right. All right. I am. So breaking the fourth wall, uh, it seemed natural. It seemed like, uh, especially with Freakazoid, you know, we'd tell a little story and then that little tick on the back of your head would say, boy, I think Joe Leahy, our announcer, needs to say something now or Freakazoid needs to say something uh, or we need to put a subtitle here. It just felt right, if that makes any sense. It was like once we established that the way we do a Freakazoid story is it's got the thinnest story, just like the lobe wants a brick or whatever. Right. right. Then you can just, you can meander, you can take your time. When a story got too complicated, that's when we knew, okay, no, we can't really do that because it needs to be just, just that tiniest little thing. And then you can just sort of meander and, and, and stuff. So I, I think we did it well because it just felt right and it was the right show to do it in. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The narrative was never more important than the gags. Yes. Right. Correct. 
But right. it, was, it was a thing you could – the narrative was almost – uh, you could say it was almost a gag in and of itself because it's a run. You keep returning back to it, you know, yeah. and the audience can be like, why do we even care about this thing? Anymore? <laughs> yeah, uh, which is why it's interesting because our, our, our first season were very short shorts, except for a couple. I think we did long ones um, and, and we kept them um, long shorts. You know, they were just yeah. Yeah, very, yeah we had a very long short, uh, but they were like really weird and kind of bizarre. And the network for our second season, I remember sitting at a we were at Amblin. And it was Steven Spielberg and Jamie Kellner, the president of the WB. Sure. <laughs> and we're all sitting around and, and Jamie Kellner said, so listen, I think the second season, you guys need to start making sense. And, and the way we're going to do this is <laughs> we're, we're going to have you tell half hour stories. And that way uh, you'll be able to make more sense. And we're like, yeah, whatever, that's fine. But all that really did was allow us to, <laughs> in my opinion, the second season I like more, but everybody's different. Because you could really pretend you were telling this story, but it just gave us kind of 20 more minutes to not make any sense. Um, <laughs> and once, once the network, I'll never forget, <laughs> we sent our first couple scripts in. And by the way, Steven Spielberg loved the show. He was like, guys, don't ever listen to anyone. Just continue doing this insanity. But the network, on the other hand, was like, Remember how we said we wanted you to make sense? Um, we kind of meant it. And uh, the scripts you're giving us, you, you've given us a five-minute Hello, Dolly song here. We don't really like this. And um, yeah, they were not, they hated us. Were they basing that off of like audience feedback or just their own feedback? Uh, their own. I mean, these guys were, so there was Jamie Kellner and he had just come from Fox and they were really trying their best to make the WB something big. And so whenever anybody says that to you, just start running because it means that they're going to talk all the time about the core demo, what the core demo wants. And they're always wrong because the core demo doesn't know what the core demo wants until you sort of say, hey, here's something new. And they go, well, we didn't know we wanted that. So they were very into, you know, demo specifics and kids. And, and we were like, look, we don't care. And having Steven sort of above us, he was just like, look, just let them, just let them do this. And, um, but yeah, the network, and I cannot stress this enough, hated the show. Oh man. Uh, they hated it because it wasn't, and then they started, they took it off the air. I remember then. <laughs> so <laughs> I love this. Their research told them that we were appealing to teenagers and college students. So now I, I want you to, Phil, I want you to try to understand this logic. So what they decided to do was they decided to put Freakazoid on first thing on Saturday morning, I believe at like at seven, because the, the network felt that kids in college would just be recovering from a binge oh. and, and would still be up. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. So there was, a, yeah. So, um, yeah. That's a strange to say. That's a weird note to make. I, well, I, I have a drawer full of them. <laughs> oh, that's cool that you kept those. That's, I, I yeah. would be framing that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always wondered this. The opening theme song refers to making a movie deal, which I'm aware could have just been a, a random rhyme that was written. But was that something you were trying to put out there into the universe? Well, no, well, uh, the so Tom Ruger, who's just brilliant, and like I said, he did Tiny Toons and Animaniacs and Freakazoid. He just wrote what he thought was funny for the theme song. And what I think Tom did was establish that, oh, okay, we're going to go totally self-referential. And that really did help us later on with Freakazoid trying to get a toy deal, trying to get all kinds of deals. <laughs> and by the way, Warner Brothers, they... <laughs> <laughs> oh my word they wanted to do they wanted to like so we're gonna try to sell some toys for the show right and we're like like what and they go well you know maybe you should use the freakamobile more that would be a good oh, toy gosh. yeah so we we're uh, at a very important meeting and the head of marketing at warner brothers was trying to tell us that we needed to sell toys and that he used the word toyetic a lot like you know the the, the car that freakazoid drives in his little buggy Oh, that's very toyetic. So once we heard that, we're like, we're, we're going to make fun of this, right? We're going we're gonna to say toyetic all the time. And we're like, oh, yeah, we are. <laughs> so that was another problem is we just, we would go into these serious meetings and we would come out and go, we're making fun of all that, right? And we did. And um, yeah. And then I think 
they would complain to Steven and Steven would be like, I think it's funny, guys. <laughs> That's the only way to really handle any kind of those those verbose words that they come up with anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We would always throw them back in some somebody's face. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's totally appropriate. And what's funny yeah. about that is the one marketing thing these companies, I think, would have sensibly behind them. They don't tend to do which is the complete seasons on you know blu-ray or dvd right yeah it's like that's the only marketing thing that people just want to watch the show right so why do you hide the show under a rock and want to push toy sales it doesn't make any sense yeah well they were they were into that and then <laughs> i remember we came up with like a, a cereal box or something and i've yeah we were always yeah we would wow. just whenever we were pulled into a meeting we would we would invariably make fun of it. In fact, if you watch, I think it's second season, uh, we use it all the time. In, and then we even put it on screen once, the word toyetic, and we broke it up phonetically. And then we had Joe Leahy explain what toyetic was. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, it was I fun. Mean, that, did you ever get a, a follow-up note where they're like, look, when we tell you something in these meetings, we don't want to see that meeting note end up on screen later? No, you know what? Now, no one believes this. And especially now having been in this business for quite a while, I don't really believe it myself. But honestly, we never got one note. The only thing we ever got was scripts would be, we would write them inside. Tom would say, hey, I think you should say this. John McCann say, would say, yeah, I think it's these. And then we would just sort of finish it and it would go next to Stephen. And Stephen would read them really fast, maybe within a day. And we would get a fax back saying, hey, it was really funny. Or, you know, have you ever thought of doing this? And that was the entire note process. The network, if they were given notes, they were giving it to Gene McCurdy, who is... The most amazing, she was our guardian angel. She was president of Warner Brothers Animation. She was always on the artist's side. And if she was getting notes, she was keeping them in a drawer somewhere because oh, Stephen wow. was, yeah, Stephen was the only one. And in fact, she was getting notes and she was keeping them in a drawer somewhere. And she was awesome. I mean, it's great to have someone in your corner like that. Yeah, yeah, she was awesome. You wore a lot of hats on that show, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, which I feel like is not so common anymore with animation to have one person be in, in charge of as many things. But what did you feel most responsible for? Like, were you mostly a writer, mostly an actor, or did you feel like you just, you were the show? Um, no, I think, so our first season, Tom Ruger was, he was in charge and he was sort of, sort of molding the show. John McCann and I were, were writing a, a lot. You know, John and I were really responsible for writing and making sure that the scripts were fun. And I only found out I was going to be Freakazoid. I think we had already written like three shows and then they're like, okay, guess what? You're Freakazoid. And I was like, oh no. Okay. Uh, cause I was. <laughs> I was really scared of, of doing it because his voice is very similar to mine. So it was, it was kind of a weird thing. It's so funny. When we were doing it, I never thought of that as being sort of a big deal. It was just like, oh, right, I got to go do the voice. Uh, it was never like, it, it was just, oh, right, we're going to record. I got to go do the voice. But mostly, I think, writing, I would definitely say. I don't think anybody else could play the character, though. That's what's funny about that. <laughs> I mean, it has to be uh, very satisfying to know. I know how I'm going to deliver this line. I, only I know how to deliver this line. Or I don't have to explain some, to somebody else what I was implying when I wrote these words. Yeah, well, that was, that was sort of the problem we were having with the casting. And I think we saw 100 people, you know. The mask had just come out or something. So everybody was doing the this. Animated like, really, was the animated Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that was with, uh, with, yeah. with Rob Paulson. Yeah, and everybody was sort of doing that manic -y energy thing, uh, which was great for the mask. And we tried to communicate them that Freakazoid, we had no idea what to tell them about Freakazoid. We're like, look, we, I don't, we don't even know. So after I think a month, Tom was getting really frustrated. And he goes, just go in there. Let's just do one with you ad-libbing and all that, that stuff and going off and on tangents. And then he played that for Steven and Steven would like to sort of looked at the calendar and said, look, just have Paul do it. We, we gotta, we got, gotta go. But it was funny when I was doing it, I was always giving every, all the other characters the best lines. You know, if you look at it, Freakazoid does go off many times and he, you know, he does Jerry and he does kind of silly stuff. But if you really look at it, all the best lines are going to Ed Asner, they're going to Ricardo Montalban, they're going to The Loeb, 
That's a um, very uh, Second City approach, isn't it? Uh, with the whole yeah. make the other guy look really good. Yeah. A- and so we would always come back to, to Freakazoid, you know, when he would go off and, and stuff. But I, I always felt that Freakazoid's lines are pretty pat. You know, it's like he's going to say, and yes, he will go off. But if you look at any episode, I think, you know, Cosgrove has the better lines. You have the straight guy who, looking visually very much the straight guy getting these lines. And then you have right. a guy that looks like a 4th of July firework <laughs> yeah. in human form. Uh, he's the one that has these very much like, uh, I'm dreading this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is, you're right. It's sort of counterintuitive, but I think it's what we discovered and made it work. But, you know, trust me, Freakazoid would go off. I mean, if you look at Dance of Doom where... I go on a like a five minute rampage of, as Jerry Lewis and stuff. That was certainly weird. But on paper, his his stuff was always very normal. Lots more with Paul Rugg after this. <laughs> Where did the character even come from? Were you pulling from the mask or were you just doing? No, no, we were just do, we were just doing our own our own thing. And I, I was a big Jerry Lewis fan. And uh, I think for Dance of Doom, which was sort of my test to go in there tom ruger was in the booth and he's like okay now go crazy go do jerry lewis do smarmy jerry do this do do that and then he cut it all together and that sort of informed who freakazoid would be okay it wasn't one person's idea that created the character himself or or was no 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 that was all of us it was whatever felt right i mean if you look at our first episode dance of doom you know freakazoid is nuts yeah. And, and then we sort of maybe discovered there's a little bit more nuance to him and maybe a little bit more self-referential, like the second one we wrote, which was Candle Jack. There's a lot more winking to camera. We're, we're making a show here. So, yeah. And did it come out of a place where someone was like, hey, we need another superhero show? Or, or... None of us wanted to watch a superhero, sh- uh, to write a superhero show. Wow. Uh, because Paul Dini and Bruce Tim developed this as sort of an edgy, dark superhero show for Steven. Steven decided he didn't want to do dark and edgy. He wanted to do Animaniacs. And so Bruce Tim was like, you know, that's not really my thing. So he left. And it was sort of given to Tom Ruger with a month, literally, until production started oh, to wow. sort of pull it t- together. So it was just throwing stuff around and seeing what worked. Well, it works really well, and, and it's inspired a fan film. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I mean, it's really creative. And, and then you guys did this live stream convention last year. Do you think- <laughs> Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a chance you guys could return to it with all of the, the rehashings of things happening lately? Uh, you mean to do a reboot? I mean, either that or like uh, Nickelodeon has a couple of their properties getting just these one-off movies, but made for TV or made for Netflix movies. You think that's a possibility? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I know that through the years, people have brought up Freakazoid, especially now that they're doing the Animaniacs reboot. Yeah. People have sort of bandied Freakazoid around. My hesitancy would always be to make Freakazoid something it's not, which is to make sense. Um, right. And I think in today's environment with so much money at stake and so many executives now, by the way, double the executives structure as there ever has been before. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, you've got two people reading it. You've got another guy overseeing it. You, and he, you know, it's just nuts that Freakazoid goes against that sort of thing. Sure. You would, you would never say, but what's Freakazoid feeling here? <laughs> right. Or what's Cosgrove want? I mean, maybe you could ask that question very, very, very simply but it's not a show about emotions or three arc story structure or anything like that. You know, you've mentioned several times that there was Tom Ruger and there were other people involved, yeah. obviously, but the show manages to hold on to this singularity yeah. of a voice, yeah. which that's hard to do, I think. Yeah, well, I think that was Tom and John and I, we liked each other a lot. We, we made each other laugh. And there was never a lot of like, oh, I don't think we should do that. There was just sort of this, you're right. I, I don't know how we became so unified to sort of a single vision, but uh, we, we latched onto it pretty fast. Well, yeah. <laughs> and it was fun. Yeah, it was great. And so these days, you've been doing uh, some really funny offshoot videos on YouTube. <laughs> Is that where you're pouring your, your creative sense uh, now? Well, no, I, I think so. I do a lot of I do a lot of writing for other shows and I miss the total freedom of Freakazoid. So I, I was like, you know, the only way I'm going to be sane 
is to, it's so easy now, you know, you've got iMovie, just put something to, together. So that is like my hobby is to just put weird things up and just have fun. And luckily I have some friends that really want to play. And then for four months, I was helping write a clean sketch comedy show called Studio C, which is a pretty popular show that's produced out of BYU television, of all things. Wow. But it's like Saturday Night Live clean. Oh, I wonder if that, that there was a girl who was in this purple mattress commercial. She came, Yes, yes, yes. That, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 She's, yeah. she's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mallory or is it? Yeah, I think it is Mallory. Yeah. 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 So that cast uh, left because they did it for nine years and now there's a new cast. And uh, so I sort of uh, was with them for four months writing some silly things. And uh, so, yeah. Well, I can, now I I'm... definitely can get behind silly with still being clean. That's a real challenging thing to do. But I'll tell you what, I was, uh, before our, our talk today, I was going back and rewatching some Freakazoid and just laughing out loud. And I feel like there's not a lot that's current these days that makes me laugh out loud. Yeah. And I don't know what it is about the sensibility you guys had on that, on that series, but it's just something about the ridiculous of it. I was trying, it reminded me a little bit of the Naked Gun series, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's fair. I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned like why there aren't shows like that now. And I think that there is a tendency to make everything R-rated. And I, I don't know whether that's Netflix. I, I don't know what that is, but there's a tendency to rely on that for the humor. And I think real comedy that is much more hard to pull off is sort of a lost art. Yeah, and there's something really interesting. Uh, this happened last December, and I was really, I was very thrown off by it. But now I think there's something societal about it was that they released the second Deadpool movie, but they released it again for families. Mm. I saw the second movie before they re-released it. And they re-released it without any of the stuff that was inappropriate for children. And all I could think right. was, if you see this as a potential market, why are you not doing this already? Like, you know what I mean? It's, a, yeah. it's an interesting yeah. thing. Yeah, no, I do. And I think that's sort of symptomatic of what's going on is we can do this. We can push it that far. Sure. And uh, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. But the art of, in fact, I was just teaching a, com a sketch writing class. Oh, cool. At a university called John Paul the Great Catholic University in Escondido. And I would teach it every Saturday. And I was like, guys, look, I can teach you in about five minutes how to get laughs out of being naughty. The trick here is to try to get laughs without being dirty. And right. it's a lot harder. So. It is. It is. And, and some of the stuff you guys pulled on, on Freakazoid, to tie it back to that, what's funny is it's not unlike some of the things I've seen in Family Guy, but for some reason, it didn't feel as gratuitous on Freakazoid. Yeah. It felt, yeah. It felt I, like I you were just being fair. silly. You just, in the moment, you're like, we're going to run with this now. And then, the, yeah. which is great because it felt a stream of consciousness, not um, we're going into this knowing that we're going to break every five seconds to do, you know, a flashback or something. Right. And that's why I think when we wrote it, it was generally, so when I was writing Freakazoid, the first page would always take a week and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I don't understand. This is terrible. And it's due tomorrow. And it's like, oh, this is terrible. That's very and, reassuring, by the way, as a fellow yeah. writer. That's very oh, reassuring. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. I would, I would rewrite the first page for a week. <laughs> uh, and then those last, you know, 14 pages I would do in a day because it, the stream of consciousness and, and then this happens. There was no thought to, but wait a minute now, uh, structure wise, why would he know that? And you know, you would just be like, I don't really care. Um, right. So yeah. Yeah. Are there things, Paul, that you found funny when you were younger and you find that somehow now they're still funny to you? Uh, yeah. Well, I tell you, so, this is no surprise, but I was a huge Jerry Lewis fan. I grew up in Las Vegas, and I remember I would, my parents took me to see Jerry Lewis at the Sands Hotel, and it was like, it was like seeing, you know, it was the most amazing thing. And then, I, and then I saw Jerry Lewis conduct the Las Vegas Symphony Orchestra. Wow. And it was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Like, he would raise his hand, the audience would go, you know, it was, it was all a big, big joke. But I was salivating. I was like, this is, this is brilliant. That stuff still holds up to me. I think my favorite comedy movie of all time has to be The Aaron Boy, which is Jerry Lewis at the Paramount Studios. Mm -hmm. uh, 
It's hysterical. So Jerry Lewis, Mel Brooks, sure, uh, all that stuff. That was all funny to me. And Python. Oh, yes. So I remember, it was 1974, when Saturday Night Live premiered, I was uh, like four, 14. And before Saturday Night Live, they would always play a half hour of Python where I lived. Sure. And that was just like, this is, this is mind blowing. Sure. This is, this is the craziest stuff. In fact, I was talking to somebody the other day and it was like, stand up in the 70s used to be so like, you know, Marty Feldman and it was like punchline, punchline joke. And then Steve Martin came along and he blew the lid off of that stuff. And it was yes. like, and that always brings me back to the core demo argument, which is people don't know what they want. If you show them something new, they will love it. So yeah, anyway. but I, I, I feel like that stuff that's genuinely funny will remain funny years later, even if yeah. it's out of context a little bit. Yeah, true. But the, uh, the stuff that's very topical, it's dated. It, it dates itself immediately. And then it's sort yep. of, so there's a reason why we can go back and talk about the Marx Brothers and we can go back and watch a cartoon from the mid nineties and still be entertained by it. Right. It doesn't really matter that there's not computers that look like giant brick ovens anymore. <laughs> we still know that it's a computer. <laughs> right, right, right. We know that it's a, a device that's used for pulling you inside and turning you into a superhero. Right. Oh, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do with a computer. <laughs> I keep getting that confused. I don't know why. <laughs> well, awesome. Uh, is there anything that you're working on right now that you are passionate about that you really want people to know about? Uh, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm putting stuff up on my YouTube page. I am playing around on Instagram. I just discovered, <laughs> because I'm old, I just discovered Instagram. And I love that you can only put minute long videos on there. Yeah. Like, I love this idea. So I'm just, uh, you know, once a day, I'm just putting stuff up. So where do we find you on Instagram? Oh, see, that would have been logical for me to tell you. But I can <laughs> tell you right now, it's rug, R-U-G, R-U-G-G-1. Um, that's it. Rug, rug, rug. One. Yeah. Rug, rug, one. So yes. That's appropriate. And then where are you on YouTube so we can watch your... Uh... Uh, it's called Paul Rugs Freundleben. <laughs> and there you will find my dog video of, of my dog, Lucky, biting me, which is the weirdest that that became a big thing. That's I a guess. huge thing. Yeah. Paul, what is Freundleben? Freundleben is a made up Jerry Lewis word <laughs> that, that we used in Animaniacs because we're like, okay, we, we, we need a Jerry Lewis word. And I'm like, how about Freundleben? And it just sort of stuck with me. So it's become now my thing to say Freundleben all the time. So that's what that is. Yeah. That's, that's pretty fantastic. Your video of how to speak Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> just under a year old now is um really fantastic oh good yeah i watched it uh, with the screen and in the place and i thought it was good with my eyes with did see the video <laughs> so i took the practice words you gave <laughs> i turned them into this i did <laughs> see there you just did it this i did yeah that's good stuff <laughs> did you have to read all that or did, can you just riff on it uh for that one, because I knew it was so specific, uh, I actually wrote it out. Yeah, subtitled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I actually wrote it out, but what was hard was like, I haven't memorized lines in a long time. And I was like, you know, and they're like, dinner. And I'm like, hold on a second. I got to <laughs> figure this out. So, uh, yeah. So I actually, I probably could have riffed, which maybe would have made it better. But yeah. Awesome. And so you were already doing the Jerry Lewis thing before any of this Freakazoid stuff came around. Oh, so, yeah. so it was oh, yeah. just a way for you to work it into it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's I was speaking with Bill Cop a few months uh, ago, and he was talking about Eek the Cat and how his voice is very similar to Eek the Cat's voice. And he would always use that voice in the meetings when they were talking about what he would sound like. And they were like, <laughs> just just do that. Just you just you do it. <laughs> so he became the voice of it because he was already doing it in his daily thing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's the same thing you were just saying, basically. Yep. That's yep. great. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, you're welcome. Really, I mean, I am I was looking forward to this conversation. I can't even tell you how much, just because I feel like we're kindred spirits. <laughs> and I just want to break out into the Freundleben every time I, I, think, <laughs> I think about this conversation. I, I, I was going to the post office today, and I was just like, okay, I'm going to talk to Paul today. And I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to randomly break out into some Jerry Lewis. And I... It, it kept coming out as Professor Frank from The Simpsons. <laughs> I kept They're being, similar. Yeah. I kept going like, uh, uh, with the, uh, the post office. And uh, I, um, that was about it. <laughs> anyway, 
thanks again. Have a okay. ha- have a great one, and uh, thank you for being here. All right, thanks, Bill. Fine, Leiven. This I did. We just heard a little of the end credits music from Freakazoid by Richard Stone. Together with producer Tom Ruger, Stone won a Daytime Emmy for the series theme in 1996. Alrighty, that's it for this episode. Special thanks go out once again to Paul Rugg for joining us here on the show. And of course, thank you so much for listening in at home. To go behind the scenes with Stay Tuned, head on over to patreon.com forward slash philmaki. Subscribing there will get you access to cool rewards like exclusive interview outtakes, my cartoon reviews, and monthly video updates. While you're at it, check out my original comic books at RetailSunshine.com and reach out to me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under the handles of both Retail Sunshine and Phil Maki. Don't forget to visit the amazing Stay Tuned community on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Stay Tuners. I've been Phil Maki, you've been a wonderful audience, and until next time, keep those eyeballs peeled, those ears open, and be sure to stay tuned.